Good morning. Um, you can remain seated, but please join me in the Lenten prayer. Loving God, you are always with us, guiding us and loving us. We know you hear us when we pray, and you listen to us whenever we talk to you. Thank you. Help us remember to take time every day to talk and pray with you, so we may be aligned with your will. During this season, help us learn how to trust you, love you, and share your love with others. Thank you for being with our church family, preparing our hearts and minds for Easter. Bless us in our work and in our prayer. In your holy name we pray, amen. And now if you would stand, if it's comfortable for you, and join me in the call to worship. Come, O people of God, let us begin our sacred time of worshipful rest. Listen to the words of the psalmist. Let us raise a joyful shout to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before God with thanks. Here we are, O loving creator. You are our God, and we are our, your people. Our hearts are open. Speak to us your message of love. And now you can join in the hymn of praise, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, number 127 in the Methodist hymnal. Please be seated. Today uh, we're celebrating and giving thanks to God for the wonderful uh, community ministry uh, that this church has been in partnership with for many, many, many years. Uh, the Girl Scouts, uh, a few weeks ago we had the occasion to celebrate the Boy Scouts and it is only just and right that we pause in this season also uh, to celebrate the wonderful work of Girl Scouts and their leaders. So I wanna invite uh, Janet to come on up 
to share with us. And um, any Girl Scouts that are here that would like to come up and join Janet, uh, as Janet shares with us um, some thoughts and uh, reflections on what does it mean to be a Girl Scout, a Girl Scout leader, and the importance of Girl Scouts and the partnership with churches. So come on up, those that are prepared to, to sit with Janet and to listen, all the Girl Scouts that are here. I know we have a few. <laughs> I know, they're a little slow. Hey, there's a couple behind you. I think you're going to... Well, I was going to skip up here with you, but I didn't see you skipping. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that today we're 111 years old? I'm not, but the Girl Scouts are. 111 years ago in 1912 in Savannah, Georgia, Louis, uh, Juliet Gordon Lowe called a friend of hers and said, I've got something for Savannah girls and for all the world. And that day, eight girls and a couple of adults got together with Juliet Lowe and they started the Girl Scouts. And you, that was eight girls. So we could start something here too. We're one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, <laughs> and, but in, in this area of the country, our Girl Scouts of Eastern Massachusetts have about, I'm terrible, terrible with numbers and I forget things too, 3,000 girls. And you know, they're all your sister Girl Scouts. And they're all over the country, all over the United States, and all over the world. I started as a brownie. Who's a brownie? You're a brownie. Some of you are daisies. Some of you are junior Girl Scouts. Oh. And she brought her brownie and her daisy um, uniforms. Now, if, a Girl Scout, if you're a Girl Scout and you have a pin, just wear the pin, that's your uniform. Now, how many of you in our congregation are or were Girl Scouts? Look at that. Okay. Jennifer is going to help us with the Girl Scout promise. Now, it's changed since I was a girl, but so I have to read it. All right? Let's stand up. And I, got, I can't hold all these. Can't hold them. On my honor, I will try to serve God and my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law. There you are. And you see, it says in our promise that we will serve God. And so coming to church and having a party in some kind of a religious uh, belonging is part of what Girl Scouts do. So maybe some of your school friends go to a different church, but they're Girl Scouts too because they have a belief. And if a girl doesn't believe in God, she might believe in another God with a different name, and she can say that word um, in her promise. Um, a lot of the Girl Scout work that I have done, I was a brownie leader for Jennifer, and, um, and then I went on to do adult Girl Scout work, and now I do a lot with international, do you know what international is? Countries. Yeah, there are about 150 countries around the world who have Girl Scouts or Girl Guides, and they're your sister Girl Scouts too. So when you think of what you're doing in your troop or in your community, you're doing it to make the world a better place. So thank you for being a Girl Scout. Well, thank you, Ms. Janet, for all that you have done for Scouts, and um, particularly the Girl Scouts. I know that uh, your family is 
uh, not only a Girl Scout family, but a Boy Scout family too. So uh, you're deeply committed to the, this movement of youth in the society and the world. So uh, any other children that are here this morning that'd like to come up and sit with me real briefly? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna do that. So Brandon, why don't you stand over there by the candle and then we'll, we'll, we'll turn off those uh, three candle lights as a way of marking the third Sunday at Lent. But I just wanted to sit here next to, to Janet and say, uh, again, thank you for everything that you have done over the years. But you know what? No matter how busy Janet is with the Scouts, she can't do it alone. She needs every Girl Scout to help do his, her part. Uh, she needs every Boy Scout to do his part to make scouting great. But the journey for Girl Scouts is never, as you heard in the promise, just about Girl Scouts. God is in the mix. And um, I'm sure there were times when, when Janet and other Girl Scout leaders just kind of like threw up their hands. I don't, just don't know what to do. I mean, th things aren't working right for us today. And they oftentimes, leaders will turn to prayer and say, God, I know you're, you're here, you're busy with us. Um, I'm going to turn this over to you. And so it's a time of prayer. So I want you to be in prayer with me, and then we're going to turn off the three Lenten candles. Let's bow our heads. Or if you're comfortable, you can put your hands together or close your eyes, whatever, whatever way that you prepare for prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this day, for this Lenten Sunday, for the journey that you have placed us on together. We thank you and pause uh, to remember and give thanks for the Girl Scouts. But overall, oh Lord, we thank you for just having patience and being with us as we walk along in life, in our young steps, in our middle age steps, in our more mature steps. You're always there with us. And from time to time, we kind of forget that, God. So we, we seek your forgiveness and we know that you love us and we know that you're always there. And when things don't go our way, Lord, we know that you will have them go your way. And your love and your presence is always there to guide us, to be a light, and to even quench our thirst when we don't know what we're thirsty for. So we thank you for this third Sunday, and we mark it, O oh Lord, by remembering the light that you shine upon us, but also the light that fades away, not for good, but fades away during the season of Lent as we await the great day of Easter. It's in your holy name we pray, amen. And Brandon, if you would just turn off three lights on the bottom, there's a switch, three lights in each candle as we mark the first light, the first week of Lent, the second week, and now we're into the third week as we continue our pilgrim journey. And Girl Scouts and friends, let's begin together the Lord's Prayer as our church community. Who wants to start? Please, Brandon, go ahead. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I'm so always so blessed to hear you pray together with me and with your congregation. And today I know you're going to study more about prayer, which is really important. You're going to learn something really neat about how to move through prayer with your hand. So have fun doing that. And thanks again for coming up. And thank you, big kid. <laughs> there are two scripture readings this morning. The first is from Exodus chapter 17, verses, verse 17. One through seven, sorry. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, 
give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? The second uh, scripture reading is Romans chapter five, verses one through five. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Linda, for sharing the text with us this morning, the lessons. I invite you, if you're comfortable standing, uh, to sing along in our next hymn, which is hymn number 2211, Faith is Patience in the Night. patience in the night, waiting for the morning light, never giving up the fight. Spirit God, give us faith. Loving creator, we come before you on this beautiful late winter Sunday. We can feel the, the warmth of the changing season sun. Time has changed. We've advanced an hour in our own way, but it is still your holy time. And this hour is for us to wait upon you, 
So speak to us, O Lord, in your own way, and as we hear it in our own way, may there be some truth that shines forth for us as we reflect on the word that you have shared with us, the message of a pilgrim people, of a struggling people, of people who knew what it was to endure persecution, alienation, and hopelessness. An endurance that was fueled by a hope and a promise that you have offered to all your people to love, to uphold, and to move forward in life and beyond. It is in your holy name, O God, that we pray. Amen. The Exodus story is a long story, and we only get portions of it through the lectionary season. But the one lesson that we have this morning before us from chapter 17 is a, is a wonderful brief snapshot of what was happening with Moses and his fellow Israelites. It was really no secret already to them that they had been following a God who had worked a miracle. Generations had been enslaved in Egypt, and they were such an essential part of the Pharaoh's industry, his building project, a huge building project. They were the brick makers. They were mixing the straw and the mud. They were doing all that they needed to do to keep Pharaoh happy so that they could continue to live. And in some accounts, they lived okay. They didn't live well. They were still indentured servants. They were slaves but they had what they needed to survive, and their families grew. But now they're out in the wilderness. And the history, the story of being enslaved in Egypt is still very much part of who they were. But they're traveling. Their God had fulfilled the promise of freedom, liberation, of new life. But as they journeyed on, off and on, that their faith would become thin and their memories would become foggy. Even though they were living proof of God's creative and reconciling love, they struggled with that identity. They had mixed feelings about this journey that Moses was leading them on, especially when times became hard and tough. And when times became difficult, they would kind of think back, and the scripture reflects this, they would think back of the cucumbers and the melons and the water and what they had back in Egypt. And all of a sudden, in their minds, as they reflected out loud to Moses, Egypt felt a little bit better than the wilderness. Even though they would be under the oppression of Pharaoh and they would be required to be worshipful to false gods. They thought it was a little bit better. But God's act, God's act of freedom and moving them out of Egypt and giving Moses the strength and the leadership endurance that he needed, it wasn't a political ploy. It wasn't anything against Pharaoh's politics other than to say no to his attitude in conviction that slavery was good. God was putting forth a a declaration by freeing the Israelites from Egypt. God was saying, this is God's intent. This is God's purpose, freedom, and well-being. It was God's creative intent that God's people have all they need to live the fullness of life. It's God's creative love that fueled the hearts and generated the hope when times were good for the wilderness sojourners. It was God's steadfast light that shined upon their feet, their very tired and dirty, worn-out feet, and directed them on God's way. It was God's presence that enabled them to take one step after another. And their faith and their faith that what they were witnessing 
through the leadership of Moses and through the experience along the way was that God was with him. And Moses, for them, was not a guide. It was not the, the experienced guide that was taking them through the wilderness experience. That Moses, they understood, and Moses understood that he was solely an instrument of God's will and way. An interpreter. Moses was a human instrument, a vessel of God's promise and freedom. He held them. And he was that instrument that broke from the structures, the human structures of slavery that were so part of the Pharaoh projects. It was God's divine way to bring God's people into God's creative intent for life. When God's people have been pushed to the margins and not living according to that intent, not because of their own choices, but because of human choices to oppress and try to deconstruct God's intent. And so God overcame Pharaoh and freely refuses to leave the weak and the thirsty. Refuses to leave God's people in a life of exile. Refuses to leave them stuck between Egypt and a hard place in the wilderness. God continues to travel ahead of and behind the wandering people. But what the wandering people forget from time to time is that God is free. God is free to be God in all situations and conditions. That's hard for us to understand sometimes when we're trying to shape our conditions and to shape God into our conditions in situations in life. Yes, God is free to be steadfast and just. And even with the doubtful and the impatient and the quarreling pilgrims in this story and with us, So what was the source of the struggle for the Israelites as they moved slowly through the wilderness? Why did they come to doubt Moses, who they had already experienced as a critical, thoughtful, religious, brave leader? Why did they come to doubt his leadership and even God's promise? What was it within them that made them think that going back to Egypt would possibly be a better choice than moving forward towards the promised land. Why, just why did the brickyards of Pharaoh's time and place have a hold on their hearts and minds? Well, in the case of this little text that we heard this morning, the answer is they were thirsty. It's really the the only answer that we have. But what were they thirsty for? They're traveling along the way. They must have had water till they come to this place where Moses decides that they will stop to camp. Rafim, they stop there. Why they stop there and there was no water, I don't know. Didn't seem like a good leadership choice, but that's where they stopped. It was a parched place. And if you spend any time in the desert, you know what that looks like. Just imagine the rocks, the scruffy plants, the sand. It's a place between the wilderness of sin, a heck of a place, the wilderness of sin, and the wilderness of the Sinai. They're not where they want to be. It's a place without life. It's a place probably with animals that knew how to maneuver through their reptiles, wild beasts, the place where they were scared, they were frightened. Not only for the environment conditions, but because they had no water. It's not a place to be sad or disheartened. It's not a place where you can gain strength when times are tough. 
And here they were, these pilgrim people have traveled so far already, and they're finding themselves in this place without water, and they are standing there looking around, and they have their two feet planted on a razor-thin edge of faith. A razor edge place of faith. They could teeter left or right and have lost their faith. And at the end of the text, the crucial question is asked while they're standing there on that razor thin edge is the Lord among us or not? Thirsting for God. Thirsting for God. Thirsting for God to do something. Thirsting for God's creative presence. The presence that had already been proven to them, provided for them, shined upon them. Is God among us or not? Thirsting for proof of God. God, show us you're here. Where is God? Where is the water? They're ready to exchange their God for lesser gods because they knew that their gods of Egypt at least provided water. Many of us have seen over the years the novelty license plate that reads, God is my co-pilot. Some of you may have even had a plate like that at one time. I know the intent of the message, and I, and I honor the faith of those who display those plates on their cars. They want to share their faith. It's a wonderful thing. But I'm troubled by one thing. I'm troubled by how one party, a manufacturer of these plates, seeks to profit off the another's faith. And to set up a certain faith dynamic that it causes us reason to pause. If I don't have the plate, is God not my co-pilot? Is God not with me? I'm troubled also because, you know, accidents happen. Even to those people who drive cars with plates that say, God is my co-pilot. One has to wonder, is the driver testing God's presence and power by placing that plate on the car? By declaring, God is my co-pilot, therefore, I, I don't need car insurance. I can go 80 miles an hour in a 45-mile zone. I'm not suggesting in any way that anyone who has a plate makes those decisions. But when we think about it in terms of faith, if I have that plate... And God is my co-pilot, is always with me, is present. <laughs> what do I expect of God? If I have an accident, or I'm about to get into the accident, I just throw my hands up and say, God, take over the wheel. And if the accident goes through, and does God not care? Is God not present in my time of need? Or maybe it's because of my lack of faith in God that God did not prevent the accident. You see what I'm saying where we were setting up in this particular example, and an example that's in the text is that we're setting up God to be the God that we want. To behave in the way that we want. To try to shape God out of God's freedom into our manufactured idea of who God is, and for what God is purposed. If anyone ever had a reason to hang a God is my co-pilot license, it would have been Moses, because he really, really had God giving him direction in speaking to him, in listening to him. But God 
was not tempted by Moses. Moses didn't try to set up situations where God had to provide and do what Moses wanted. Moses never asked the question, is the Lord among us or not? You never hear that coming from Moses. When Moses had to make a decision about something, he turned to his elders and they figured out what they needed to do next. They needed to move forward, to camp, to change the direction, to solve problems. He had his elders, those who were in the position to provide key leadership and an example of faith along his side. When conditions rose to the level beyond his abilities, Moses turned to God prayerfully. He entered into a conversation with God. He prayed. He asked questions. He didn't tell God what to do, didn't ask God to do anything, but he did ask God for help. He asked God to help him with his congregation, who was literally willing to take Moses' life. Moses prays to God, help me, what am I to do? They're about to stone me. The people on the edge of faith were just about to step off. And so Moses is seeking wisdom, seeking wisdom in prayer, hoping to restore God's relationship. with a thirsting people. But it wasn't God's relationship with a thirsting people, it was the thirsting people's relationship with God. God speaks. God directs Moses to go ahead of his people, to separate himself from his people, to take a few elders, those that he could be sure would be prayerfully present with him, Moses, and they would go ahead and to take what he had already used, a staff, a, that staff that was proof of God's creative love and presence, he had already used it to tap the Nile, which became a source of water that could not be drunk. And so Moses is looking for God. God already said, I will be there standing on a rock. You can hear the conversation. Moses is not asking for anything special, just asking for guidance. For God to be God. And there Moses encounters God standing on a rock and is instructed to tap that rock, to hit that rock with his staff, and there water will flow. There Moses will open up God's creative love with one strike of the staff, and water will flow for the thirsty, faithless pilgrims all because Moses stayed steadfast in relationship and in prayerful presence with God. And in this story, water is the sign of God's promise. God's promise, love is for all who God is in relationship with, who God loves, and even for those who God finds have fallen out of love with God. There's no limit. There's no boundaries. And the pilgrim people find that they have this new fresh water. Their thirst is quenched. Life and faith are restored. They're ready to go on because their needs have been met. But Moses does a little theological reflection on this moment and probably used it as a way of reminding his people in preaching. He, he marked that place. He gave it two names a time and place when God's people tested God's faithfulness. And that's where we often find ourselves in life. We cry out to God, are you here with us? Are you here with me or not? Where are you? It's a reality in life that we struggle with, and even the people who had come to know Jesus through the apostles, they struggled Is the Lord with us or not? And Paul writes to his congregation in Rome. They're struggling themselves. They are a thirsty people. And he proclaims to them in this letter, 
that faith alone, faith alone, there's nothing that you can do. You are justified by faith. You are put in right relationship. You are put on the right way. You are a pilgrim people. Believe. Hold fast to your faith. Discover the peace that you have with God through Jesus Christ. For God has freely given us a font of grace and salvation, proclaims the Apostle Paul. And then, without even pointing to the people of the Exodus, St. Paul says, for while we were still weak, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Thinking of the pilgrim people in the Exodus, they, while they were still weak, God acted even though they were ungodly in their minds and their hearts, thinking that it would be better to go to Egypt and to worship the gods of the Pharaoh. And then St. Paul goes on to say, but God proves God's love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, justified by God's grace. The Exodus lesson in St. Paul's message proclaim God's creative love and intent. Love and intent. And while we live our pilgrim lives wandering into and out of the wilderness, however you may experience your wilderness, we must hold fast to the truth that God goes before us. One station in life to the next, God goes before us. And when we get stuck in faithfulness, in that wilderness, and we doubt whether God is really going forth ahead of us, we must remember in that moment of faithfulness that God is not a God of abandonment. We may feel that abandonment in our own hearts and minds, but we must hold fast to that thread, that golden thread that goes through all of Scripture that reminds us that God never leaves God's people to their own devices. We can construct all the different self, self, the schemes and ideas that we want. And in our ignorance, there is still nothing there in the selfishness or the forgetfulness or the impatience or the faithlessness that will separate us from God. In Christ Jesus. It's God's love in Christ that makes known God's grace. That love, that unmerited love that flows forth and gives birth to reconciliation. That is that birth that brings people back together in relationship to God, that quenches the thirst for love and peace. It is that very love in Christ that pours forth God's grace even to those who we might think are never worthy. It is worthy, a grace that is worthy for all to have and share, for hope is fragile. The pilgrim people of Israel arrived at a station in their journey where their hope was weakened to the point of asking that question, is God present or not? For our hope is fragile as well. As it may dry up, we must hold fast to the reality that there is a font. There is a font of grace that is ever flowing. And that by our own faith, by our own faith, we are justified and able to tap into that flowing faith and grace. As thirsty and exhausted as we may be through life and suffering from one place to another in our experiences, we find our endurance, again, like our faith, spread thin. But the same God that said yes to the people of Israel 
has said yes to us. Has said yes to us in the promise of Jesus Christ, of the grace that has been poured out. There's no reason, but there are circumstances for us to throw our hands up from time to time. But as we throw them up and we open our hands like this and we say, I just don't know. Remember that you have open hands and that God is ready when we are ready to receive the gift of promise, of hope, of grace. For God is at work in spite of our undoing faithfulness. God is not absent when we are. And scripture over and over again provides us with stories that remind us of God's creative love and steadfast intent to love. It's God's way. And we are responsible. We are a responsible people, a people of faith who are called to remember, responsible to remember and reclaim these stories. The stories that help us along in our own way. And that's what's so wonderful about this little Exodus story is that you can go back to it as short. When you're feeling like you're in the wilderness or thirst for faith is so great. And we are responsible for living responsibly in the light of God's word. And when we experience God's response to us in the wilderness, we're called to share that good news. In the season of Lent, we share the good news in many ways, particularly in the disciplines. We share it by prayer and meditation and service and almsgiving. We respond to God as God responds to us. We have no reason to test God. We may want to from time to time. Even in our worst moments and situations, when we're about, oh, this is, God has really just let go of everything. It is in that doubt, it is in that depth, that if we are patient enough and wait long enough, God's presence will be made known. and will act. It's a matter of faith and belief. It's not easy. That's why St. Paul talked about endurance and hope. We need both and more. Let us remember that there is no thirst that God cannot quench in this life or the life to come. May we, the pilgrim people, be reminded and go forth into the wilderness of life, accompanying one another with the hope and the promise and the knowledge and the confidence that God goes with us, no matter what. Amen. Let us pray then. Lord, we come before you with honesty, for we do at times wonder where you are in the midst of our own lives and in the life of this world. But scripture and experience and reason and tradition tell us that even in the midst of our fragility and our doubtfulness, you are present. And in ways that we can never imagine, you make yourself known to us. You make us aware and knowledgeable of your intent when you provide opportunities and resources for those who come to this country seeking safety and freedom and somehow find a lawyer. And some of those lawyers, oh God, are funded by your people who give generously to New England JFON, 
And so we praise and thank you for making yourself known to us, for answering that very question, are you with us or not? And then we pray, oh God, that Elliot and those who surround him in a time of wilderness and thirsting for wellness, when you make yourself known, oh God, to him and to those who gather around him in a way that gives strength and endurance. We pray for that, Lord. We pray for the healing and the confidence that you are there. You are there for the people of Ukraine, even though we see their world crumbling literally and figuratively. Even though we see them taking the brunt of hate from a mighty power. If you can lead people to freedom out of Egypt, Lord, we trust and we are confident that you can lead the people of Ukraine out of the oppression that they are in by softening the heart of those who carry out such acts of death. We pray, O Lord, for peace. We pray, O Lord, as well, for those people that are in Syria and Turkey still trying to figure things out, put their lives back together. We pray for the relief workers, for the workers that are pulling rocks from one place to another and trying to do the best that they can bring closure to those who have lost loved ones. We pray for our neighbors in California who are just dealing with weather upon storm upon storm. And for our brother Harry who is recovering from surgery. For Linda who's living with COVID. And for all those neighbors near and far who still struggle with the realities of this virus. We remember, oh God, that it was three years ago that we gathered in a place that we never imagined would be our church, our homes. But you came through, oh God, you gave us what we needed to endure. And in our prayers, we found answers, and in our technology, we found ways to communicate with one another and to hold fast to our commitment to worship you. And we pray for Frank as he prepares for surgery. For all those that we know that are in our midst, that are praying and crying out for healing, O Lord, that your healing presence embrace them, hold them, and move them forward in life. We pray, O God, for our community, for our church, for the commonwealth, and for our nation. We pray, O God, that we will grow in neighborliness in the midst of polarization and divisiveness. Strengthen your church so that we may be the voice that you wish to have heard in the community and in the world, proclaiming your love, your peace, your justice and mercy. Amen. I invite you to prepare for our offering as the handbell choir comes forward. You can prepare to offer yourself and your gifts to the ministry of Jesus Christ.
Please pray with me our prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Gracious Creator, we thank you for the bounty of your harvest. Blessed are those who have enough to eat and clean water to drink. Lord, we acknowledge the sorrowful injustice of hunger and thirst for the basics of life. May our lives in these offerings find a way to your will for the fullness of life. Let's go forth uh, into the world, uh, into the wilderness. Uh, let's go forth as those pilgrim people who are able to answer the question, is the Lord with us or not? And with a loud yes, the very same yes that God has proclaimed to us in Christ Jesus. We are God's people. We are vessels of God's love, overflowing, and able to share that same love with others. So go in peace and love.